Web Systems, Week 6, Operating Systems Number 3, Part 1, Process Management. This week we're talking again about operating systems. Just a quick recollection that the web runs on both the network and servers running on an operating system somewhere out there on the net. And if you recall, these operating systems do things like manage your computer, runs programs, provide an interface between users and hardware for the graphical or non-graphical interfaces, they provide services to different types of programs and users, and it provides security. So let's take a look at an example specific to the web. Obviously a web server runs various programs like HTTP, um, maybe SSH for your terminal emulation. What we're going to cover is how does the operating system run these programs. So just a few things we'll do first. This lecture series is going to cover three things. First of all we're going to cover processes. Then we're going to talk about resources that these processes require. And then we're going to talk about memory and how these are used by these processes. Just to clarify some terminology, a process is a program that's running. So a program is a file, basically something like chris.exe. And when these programs are executed, the process contains a copy of the code, a bit of memory, and resources that a process might need. And every time you run a program, you'll get a new copy of these. So if I run chris.exe three times, one, two, three, I'll actually have three separate processes running the same program. So keep that in mind. There's also system processes. For example, the things that control the mouse or the antivirus, or things like the network interface and so on. And the, the job of an operating system is to actually manage these processes. In fact, there's usually one main process in the system when it initially starts, called the kernel. Sometimes it's called init, or something else. It depends. It's often called process number one, so keep that in mind. So the operating system starts these processes, it manages the running processes. It performs a thing called IPC, inter-process communication, and of course it kills the processes as well. So let's look. When a computer runs a process, typically what will happen is you can often run more than one. A good example is Windows. I'd be running PowerPoint, I'd be running the mouse, I'd be running many other programs like Microsoft Word, for example. And traditionally, ancient computers used to often run one task only. That's what we call an embedded system. A good example is your watch. Not an Apple watch, that's a real smart thing, but an old boring watch or something that's running your washing machine or something like that. Its sole job is to run one process called run the device. Ancient mainframes, like the IBM mainframes, used to run systems called batch processing, where basically you write a job, a program, you put it in a queue and execute it when it gets to it. A classical uh, IBM operating system was called MVS. And this is the old days where you see little tapes running on machines, uh, flashing lights, etc. That's a batch processing system. Back to the real world, we tend to run the concurrent programming systems, which means it runs literally more than one program at the same time. Classic way of doing this thing called multi-programming, which is a bit old now. For example, Windows 3 was a classic example of that. Most modern operating systems run a thing called multitasking, uh, for example, Windows 3.1, or Windows 4, if such a thing really exists, Windows XP and so on, or Linux. Multi-threading, I'll talk about that later, and multi-processing, which is the current trend. So let's see, how does a computer actually run a process? Well, reality is, these processes have to be in various states. What happens to the computer when it starts a process? has to create a process. So it loads the program into memory. So we could load our program, 
Chris.exe, loads up from a disk, loads it into memory. Once it's in memory, the system will set up all its resources, like it needs, say, a prompt of some kind or access to a mouse or file of some kind. The process, once it's created, just sits there and waits till the operating system says you can run. So it's in a wait state. Once it's allowed to run, the operating system runs it and it keeps running until it's blocked. Typically it's blocked when it needs something. For example, it might need a mouse or keyboard, for example, or mouse or something like that, or a file where it needs to read a block of data. When it's blocked, it waits until the operating system either gives a resource to it or says you can keep on executing. And we just keep going around and around and around, practically for infinity, until the operating system says you need to stop. So it keeps looping, unless the program itself decides to stop or the operating system decides to kill it. And obviously the final state of a process is the stopped state or terminated state. Now you notice earlier I said that it can be blocked. In other words, it's waiting for a resource of some kind. Well, an operating system will typically create a thing called an interrupt to stop this execution. So the program could be running and saying, I want to read a file. It'll get a type of what's called a, a wait for a block of data. It's an interrupt of some kind. Or the system itself could intervene. For example, you hit Control alt delete or press Control c for example, or move the mouse, or get some information from the network, like the browser. Or the program simply dies. All these things are called interrupts, and there's different types of interrupts. But once these interrupts are hit, the process comes to a halt and goes back into a waiting state. Um, often there's a special interrupt handler that has to cope with these interrupts. For example, if the system, if the program has a fault, you might get an error message pop up saying runtime error of some kind, and it might jump straight from running straight into the stop state. Or it could do various things, for example, because if you wait, the interrupt handle could be read the block of data from a file. These interrupt handles are really critical for an operating system. So, we run these programs as a process, we have to decide. How does the operating system decide to run which process? Well, there's a thing called a scheduling algorithm, and it really depends on the operating system that you've got. And some operating systems have more than one. But most operating systems will schedule a process using a thing called a queue. When we're running our first process, we might have our second process start. It simply sits there and does nothing. It's waiting to execute after process one. Our third processor, process and our fourth process. So we simply say, we'll simply, when process one's finished, process two start, when process two becomes process three, and process three becomes process four. I think I probably got that backwards. Process four becomes process three, process three becomes process two, and process two becomes process one. These processes which aren't running are called waiting processes. Okay, the algorithms to be used is a bit out of scope of this class, but just for your information, there's different types. The classic ones called first in, first out. In other words, fair share queue. The first person in gets running. The second person starts second. The third person starts third. Or it could be preemptive, which is a classic case in um, what we call um, multi-processing, multitasking operating systems. Round robin, which is a fair share system. There's plenty of other algorithms out there. You can Google it if you wish, but um, it's not required for this subject. Now, I mentioned a couple of times about multi-programming and multitasking. Just a quick description of them. Multi-programming is also known as cooperative, and that's why it's based on Windows 3.1 or Windows 3. Um, what happens is a process keeps running until it's blocked waits for I.O. Then the control passes to the next process. Biggest problem is, if you have an infinite loop, the process never returns, and as far as you're concerned, the system has hung. Or it could be in a loop during a picture, for example. That's not a very good example of how to write code. 
Microsoft actually recommended that you write your code to call it a routine called wait or idle when you're not doing anything. Um, Windows 3.1 later operating systems have a special timeout, it's called a watchdog. What it does is after a certain amount of time the system will say you're not responding. Do you want to kill it? Yes, no. The better way to do it is what we call a preemptive operating system, multitasking if it's called. We basically say every process can have a certain amount of CPU time and it's a countdown. So it says after, so for example, 0.1 of a second you have to give up some time and the system will actually halt you and switch to the next process. Now you can have priorities with this and if you go into Windows you can type Control alt delete sorry Control alt escape the task manager and you can see that every process has certain priorities high, normal, real time and so on. What it means is a real time process can jump over all the other processes so it's like a rank effectively. Your queuing algorithm decides which process runs next, but again, you can set up many priorities. For example, a low priority could be the virus scan. Just some examples. Now, a few more techniques you can do as well as you go advanced um, operating system scheduling. Multi-threading is a relatively new technique from the last 10, 20 years, where you have the same process, the same code. Everything's running in one process, but you have different threads running through the code. It's sort of like an internal multitasking. The advantage is you're running the same code. A good example is PowerPoint. I could have one thread per presentation. In that case, I have one copy of PowerPoint in memory. This allows you to have big pieces of code and run multiple threads. Another classic example of games. Each thread could represent a sprite or an object on the screen, could represent an individual object like one thread per monster for example. Best thing about this, these threads are relatively independent. Right? Got three threads here, four threads, my apologies. You could if you had a four-way processor, each one of these threads could be running on a CPU. Which means your program can run theoretically four times as fast. In reality it isn't always that fast, but it's a lot more efficient, especially when doing huge amounts of calculations like graphics, rendering, um, making music, and so on. But it's very efficient because you have one copy of code in memory. Finally, the last option, multi-processing, is multi-threading with multiple CPUs. So, that's the example I gave you. We have four CPUs running a thread in each in each part of the program. So you're your program, your process in memory actually has four or more CPUs running it at the same time. Be careful by the way, if you're running an Intel processor like the Core Series, i5 and i7, they have a concept called hyper-threading. This is a bit of a fake thread because the CPUs are so efficient they can actually start running an instruction at the same time as a previous instruction. They're making use of the gaps in timers to execute. So it could claim, for example, my i5 laptop claims it's got four processors as far as Windows is concerned, but it's only a dual core. In other words, it only actually has two CPUs. It's just one of these quirks of how you do operating how you do CPUs. I'm not really going to explain that, but you can look it up yourself. Now, when we have processors, especially when we're going to run more than one, we might want to communicate with each other. Um, Classical ways of communicating with each other include file sharing, we share a common file, we share a bit of memory, we send signals to each other, we send messages to each other by sockets or messages. Or we use a thing called pipes. Now, sim fours and locks we'll talk about a bit later. We've already seen pipes in our Linux gym chapters. Process A goes to process B by using the vertical bar the pipe operator. So the output from LS goes into more. I did mention processors can communicate in one direction, but they can also communicate in two directions. Shared memory is a good example. Process A writes to our shared memory. Process B reads and writes into the same chunk of memory. There's a special type of shared memory called a named pipe. 
it's not like a vertical bar, but it's effectively a special type of file. So instead of reading and writing a file in, in memory, you just write to this pipe and the result magically appears in the other process. You can do it via sockets, and a good example is networks. They're virtual communications between processes running on different computers, and you're going over a network. Some of these sockets are internal. If you ever type the word netstat, netstat, you'll find there's a special type of, of pot socket called Unix. This is on Linux only, of course. And it's a special internal doesn't go out the network, but as far as a program is concerned, it's talking to something like a like a part, like a port in TCP/IP. A really interesting type of communication is called message queuing and message passing. This is used a lot in IoT, Internet of Things, and it's also used as a way of sending communications to each other via messages. A bit like SMSs, you send a message or a bit of internal email to each other. You could even address it. A bit out of scope of this subject but it's out there in the programming world. I mentioned semaphores on locks. This is just a special file. So you can say, I've got it. You say, like a checkbox, I've got it. And then when you release it, you say, I'm free, and so on. That's all it is. A lock and a semaphore are very, very similar. So we've learned about the differences between programs and processes in the scheduling. Most modern operating systems do multi-processing. We have multi-CPUs and multi-threads, even on the Raspberry Pi, which is a quad processor. In Chapter 5 of Linux Chimp, we'll make heavy use of the concept of inter-process communication using pipes, sending outputs from one program to another program. One more thing I forgot to mention, you've seen the greater than sign. We can use, for example, Cal, for example. This greater than sign is actually a special form of IPC. It's running a special type of program internally called write to a file. Simple as that. 